I'd like to take a moment to uh, do a demonstration video on how to play a tracker organ. A lot of pianists and organists who play tracker organs complain that the action is really stiff and they're unable to play because, uh, because the action is stiff, but in reality it's not the action. The, the principles of, of physics and ergonomics that go into playing the tracker organ are identical to what you are supposed to use when you play an electronic organ or a piano or an electronic keyboard. Regardless of the instruments, the principles remain the same. It's about 20 degrees in this church, so I'm not going to be playing for you because my, I'm freezing. I encourage all pianists to, um, to practice a little bit on a tracker organ because the tracker instrument will reveal to you any flaws you have in your technique and uh, the, the discerning what the actual flaw is, that's the hard part. And hopefully I can cover those in this quick video tutorial. Uh, the first tool in, in playing on a tracker is simply gravity. The weight of the arm is, which pr is what, what plays the key. When the weight of the arm plays, then you don't use the fingers. See, a lot of pianists think that the, it's the, the fingers that play the keyboard, but in reality, it, it's, it's not. The muscles on the fingers and in the hand are extremely weak, and they work so hard at building up those muscles to compensate for the bad movement, when all you really need to employ is, is good ergonomic movement, and you don't need strong muscles here. So in order to flex the finger, you have these flexor muscles here in the forearm. When you flex these muscles, they pull on the tendon, which runs through the wrist, uh, through the palm, and it, they attach to different locations of the fingers. So when you flex these muscles, the fingers flex. Up here you have the extensor muscles. When you, when you extend or flex these muscles, or they, um, they allow the fingers to extend. Note that you can't flex and extend at the same time. If you do, that's when you usually, if you keep one finger up and flex the others, and that's called a dual muscular pull because what's happening, since all these muscles are interconnected, if you flex and extend, you're, you're using two groups of muscles to do one activity at the same time. All five fingers should do the same thing at the same time. Never isolate. A lot of the old technique books like Hannon stress that you, you keep a relaxed hand and you raise one finger high, but that's it's very damaging. If you do that, you can feel the stress and strain in, in the musculature, so you shouldn't do that at all. So the weight of the arm comes from the elbow. The elbow is... is um, is like a hinge or a fulcrum and you just raise the arm up like that and it is what presses the key down. Actually it's the bicep which raises it but you let gravity drop it back down. Once you let your finger drop down into the key, you never press into the key bed because pressing doesn't do anything. So there's no reason to press. Plus playing the keyboard is an up motion because you got to get up and off to go to the next note. So the weight of the arm is what plays the key. The second motion that is, is required to play a tracker is uh, forearm rotation. In the elbow, around the elbow here, we have two sets of muscles. The supinators, which allow you to supinate your hand, and the pronators, which allow you to pronate your hand. You can't do both at the same time. And that's good because um, the supinators and pronators work with one another. and, and those two groups of muscles rarely become fatigued, mostly because when you supinate, the pronators rest. When you pronate, the supinators rest. So you could do this without getting fatigued. Whereas if you isolate a finger, if you raise your finger up, you are extending them and working the extensors and pulling on the flexors. And while you're keeping some of these fingers down, they are flexing while your extenders are extending. And again, if you do that enough, you will get fatigue and uh, maybe even pain in your, your hands. And if you have to shake the tension out of your hands, it's because you're doing something wrong. And usually it's using two groups of muscles to move one bone. So we have four, forearm rotation. And what pronating and supinating does for you is, is that um, if I want to play the thumb down, I just rotate. I, I, I come from a supination position to a pronating position and I just rotate into the thumb. Same thing with the pinky. A lot of musicians think that the four and the five finger are, are weak fingers, but they're not when you, um, well one, if you rotate, the pinky is just as strong as the, the others because you rotate. But a second movement that's going on because you're pronating and rotating from the elbow, 
The second motion there is using the elbow to align the forearm with the pinky. Uh, if, if a pianist were to stretch out the hands and play like this, you've got to bend right here in the wrist, or, well, in the finger. And so the pinky, of course, is going to feel weak because there's no fulcrum here. There's no alignment. But with an adjustment of the elbow, you can align the pinky, and it's just as strong as the other fingers because it's aligned. So you need that constant alignment of getting the arm behind the finger. And if you do that, you're going to break the alignment. Same thing if you twist. A lot of pianists like to static load and sit and play like this, and then they twist their, their wrist. This is called ulnar deviation, and this is called radial deviation. And when you do that, you break the fulcrum, you break the alignment of the finger all the way up the forearm, because it's the forearm that gives us the strength and power. The same way this, these fingers are aligned perfectly by nature. They're just, just naturally aligned, so they, they have strength and power. Well, so does the four and the five if you do an, a slight adjustment from the elbow where the supinators and pronators are. The supinators and pronators are also what we use to trill and tremolo from. If you're using your finger muscles to do tremolos and trills, you're, you're, not going, to, um, you're going to get fatigued quickly. Whereas if you rotate from pronating and supinating, that's where the... Um, that's where the that's where the, um, the rotation comes from. That's where tremolos come from, from pronating and supinating. And you won't fatigue doing this because you're resting. When the supinators are supinating, the pronators rest. When you pronate, the supinators rest. So we have two movements which go into playing. We have gravity and a rotation. Combined gravity and rotation, and the thumb and the pinky and all the fingers have a lot of power because you've got the weight of the arm and the power of the arm behind it. Now, as far as, as, um, uh, as the thumb goes, a lot of pianists are taught to curl the thumb under the palm, and that's bad for several reasons. The first is, let me talk about the other fingers. Uh, these are the flexors, and this, these are the abductors. Ab means uh, away, and duct means uh, to lead. So to abduct means to lead the fingers away. So. When you abduct, that's, that's stressful right there. I can feel the hand naturally wanting to adduct or come back together into its relaxed position. But if you abduct and then flex your fingers to play, you are creating a dual muscular pull because you are abducting and flexing at the same time. Two muscle groups doing one thing to a bone. And they just pull on one another and you're going to get fatigue and tension, maybe pain and injury if you do that. And again, as I said before, a lot of pianists will, will practice so much that they do build up muscles to compensate for what they perceive as being weakness. But you don't have weakness. You already have enough muscle to move your bones around the way you need them to or the way you want them to. So, so those are the fingers abductors, and these are the fingers flexors. The thumb's flexor is in the palm. So that's the strongest muscle of the thumb, the flexor. The thumb's abductor is here. And that's a weak muscle. Abductors are naturally weak. So a lot of piano, piano teachers teach their p teach students to play the thumb with the weakest muscle, and that's the abductor. They also ta teach pianists to, when they're playing a scale or an arpeggio, to cross the thumb under the palm. And what's bad about that is when you cross it under, you have to uncross it, and that can take time, and that can create unevenness in, in unevenness in playing. Also, when you flex and then abduct, that's a dual muscular pull. You're going to develop problems with the thumb. Second thing that's wrong here, or actually the third, is that the forefinger and the thumb tendons intersect. And that's not really a problem. They, they intersect, but when you flex the thumb and then flex the fingers, these two tendons grind together and you can develop um, thumb problems because you're grinding these two tendons together. So it's never a good idea to, to cross the thumb under. You play the thumb, you can rotate take down into the thumb, then you can play the next finger, and then the third finger. Now I, my thumb wants to play this G. A lot of teachers will teach you to simply cross the thumb under and then play the G. But we have the elbow which can help us. It's called the walking arm. And if you play one, three, five, and the, the elbow comes up, and you do a slight rotation of the thumb, the elbow helps propel the, the arm over, and the thumb can rotate into the next key. The 
same same thing happens when we go down. You play the pinky, then the three finger, then the two finger, then the one, and then instead of crossing the whole f hand over the thumb, you just bring the elbow up and you rotate down into the G. The same thing occurs with the scale. If I'm going to be playing the scale, the teacher would tell me to put the thumb under the palm, but if I bring the elbow up, you notice it automatically places my thumb above the F, then all I have to do is pronate down into the next note, and the same thing happens here. I play the four, and then I can rotate the thumb down into the C. And the same thing occurs when going down. If I bring the elbow up, places my middle finger right over the E, and I can rotate down to it, or, or supinate down to it. Another movement which goes into playing these, these, these stiff heavy notes is um, a, an, a forward shift. Pianists should always be forward shifting into the keys because one, our natural relaxation, if, if you relax at the keyboard, your tendency is to want to contract and, and, and bring your arms back down. So if you were to fall asleep at the keys, your hands would come down. Also, pianists are sometimes pressing into the keys or or just doing funny things with their hands, and they, they may get a sensation of falling off the keys. That's why you always have to have a little slight forward shift into the key. There's another reason for that too, is because when you're playing the black keys, or brown in this instance, the um, black keys are higher than the white keys. If you're playing a D scale, for instance, D, E, F sharp, if you're playing with, a, if you're static loading and just, just playing with, um, with fingers that don't move or a relaxed hand, if you're going to reach for the F sharp, you might miss it because you're right on the edge of it and you're probably going to miss it because you're reaching up to it. But if you forward shift and you have a slight lift from the elbow, when you hit the F sharp, you're coming down on top of it like that instead of grabbing for it. Because right now I can feel my hand wanting to come down and I'm going to miss the next note. But when you're up here, then you can rotate down to the next note. So an in, a forward shift is always helpful. You need it with all five fingers. Another thing you need is an in-out motion. If you notice, all five fingers are a different length. And the keys are lighter on the edge than they are on the inside. And I'll demonstrate that in a minute. So when you play the thumb, and then you play the index finger, you want to come out a little bit, because the index finger is a little bit longer. And the middle finger is a little bit longer, so you come out. The, middle, the ring finger is a little bit shorter, so you can forward shift in. The pinky finger is shorter, so you forward shift in. Notice you did, didn't really use the fingers. It all came from the arm and the elbow. When you combine weight, rotation, in and out, and forward shifting, it gives you all the power you need to play this instrument. So because the fingers are a different length, you got to play out here and that'll make it easier. I have with me a bunch of nickels and you can see the weight of these nickels is not enough to make this key go down because it's just ever so slightly pressing it, but not enough to make it go down. So I, I, I might not be able to do this demonstration, but so you can see how much weight it would take to press one of these keys down. Okay, I have here 16 nickels, and I'm going to place them on the edge of the key. And when I let go of the key, the nickels will press the key down. And that's to display that the keys are lighter on the edge. When I place the same group of nickels on the inside of the key, they're not heavy enough to produce a tone. So, because the keys are lighter on the edge, it would behoove the pianists or organists to play on the edge of the keys. But because of the fingers are all a different length, that requires them to play an in and out motion. Uh, to compensate, a lot of pianists will curl their fingers and they play with cur curled fingers. But when you curl, and flex, you're creating a dual muscular pull. So curling isn't good either. So you have to have the in and out motion, which comes from the elbow. It's the elbow that places the hand in and out of the keys.